Hi everyone, and thanks for joining us this afternoon. I'm going to hand over now to uh, Dr. Barrow, who's joining us from Arizona today. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Mamadou Barrow. I'm here in uh, Tucson, Arizona, from the University of Arizona. Um, and uh, basically, you know, this has been a wonderful series of uh, talks, you know, and um, the major purpose really is to share uh, knowledge on an important uh, uh, issue. And we have uh, distinguished, you know, speakers, you know, from the beginning all the way to today. Uh, it started first with uh, Abu Bamba, um, and who, who stressed the importance of the uh, convention and the need for action plans. Action plans are really very important. One thing is to talk, another thing is actually do something about what we are talking about. So um, that was very interesting. And then that was followed by uh, Linda uh, Godfrey, who actually um, talked about the challenges of plas plastic waste management in Africa. What are the key challenges? What are the problems, the constraints? And, uh, and uh, so that was also very, very important. Um, after that, we had uh, you know, um, three panelists also, uh, Thomas, you know, Myers from the grid, uh, uh, Arandal, uh, Percy uh, Onyawa from the Basel con Convention, and also Linda Goodfrey also. Uh, so they talked about primary drivers and sources of plastic waste and valuable experiences managing the, in Africa. So the, the, the experiences also are very useful. And um, all these talks also are available through, um, you know, they've been recorded and they can be made and available also uh, now uh, through the recordings. And then we had uh, Dow uh, Stein um, and, and Daniel uh, Yao, who also talk about action for producers um, and, and converters at the heart of the plastic industry. After that, um, Eva uh, Uveska uh, talked about plans to manage raw and virgin materials. Uh, that was followed by uh, Anna B, you know, Pretorius, who also talked about action necessary to better manage different plastic uh, polymers. So that's also was useful in terms of uh, what is really needed at this point. And the last one was uh, David Drew uh, from Coca-Cola. Uh, it's important also to focus on, on some of the big players like Coca-Cola. Uh, and uh, this was about voluntary and mandatory ex uh, extended producers' responsibility. I mean, what are the what are the responsibilities of some of the major, I mean, key uh, stakeholders in this area? So these all are very important and very useful. And uh, I've been following them and, uh, you know, uh, learned a lot from it. So this is going to be very useful in terms of the future action plans that are going to be developed. So over to you. Good. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mamadou. And thank you also for getting up so early in Arizona to be part of it, not only now, but in previous discussions. <clears throat> we are building progressively the different aspects of what should be part of the national and regional action plans. And since economics is really going to be driving the future of plastics, it's really important that we have a better understanding of these. And particularly, we need to consider them and incorporate them into not only the way in which nations have looked at, but into the action plans that guide the regions as well. So we are very lucky to have today with us Professor Risa Daniels, who's going to be addressing us. And from a perspective of Sustainable Seas Trust and the African Marine Waste Network, we value very much the association that we have with him at the School of Economics at the University of Cape Town, because he's a wonderful strategist and thinker. So it's, it's a real pleasure for me then to introduce Professor Daniels and say, and welcome him and basically hand over to him as he indicates to us the role that economics has to play. And he obviously can't cover the entire field, but he can give us a summary of the role that economics plays in the development of national and regional action plans. So Risa Daniels, over to you with huge thanks from us. Uh, thanks, Tony, for your kind introduction. Uh, it's a real honor to be invited to this forum to share with you some of the work uh, that I've done on uh, thinking through how best to design policy instruments that can help countries uh, begin to reduce marine plastic litter. Uh, and this has been uh, a paper that we recently published and I've circulated uh, both the paper and these slides uh, to uh, the uh, conference uh, organizers 
So they are available uh, for anyone that is in this presentation. And you can also email me directly uh, for a copy of either the presentation or slides, should you not uh, have access to them. Um, I'm going to speak to you today about how to think through a framework for uh, designing both behavioral and economic policy tools to reduce marine plastic debris. Now, what's important uh, about the theme of this presentation is when we think about designing behavioral tools, we're often talking about how to uh, nudge consumers in such a way that we incentivize them to take the correct type of action, such as separating waste at source. But it also incorporates uh, behavioral nudges for producers, uh, which may often come in the form of incentives for them to uh, recycle or for them to have some form of deposit refund schemes or the like. So in addition to the economic policy tools that I'm going to discuss, I also incorporate these behavioral insights so that uh, it is possible for any country, regardless of their uh, level of national economic development, whether they're high income countries or poor income countries, um, but it, it's possible to utilize the same framework to figure out where to begin to uh, address marine plastic pollution. I'm just waiting for my screen uh, to progress to the next slide. Okay. That seems to be working now. So this paper authors around the world, uh, we come together under a group called Environment for Development, uh, which is um, based in Sweden and has offices in many different developing countries in the world. My collaborators are from um, Sweden, India, Costa Rica, South Africa, Vietnam, Chile, and Tanzania. And what we all did in this project is we spent roughly two years trying to think about how we can combine our collective insights to deal with the problems from one of uh, the very poor countries and regions of the world through to some of the wealthier countries. Uh, this work was sponsored by the Swedish International Development Agency. And we came together under the auspices of trying to find solutions to help policymakers around the world um, be able to tackle marine plastic pollution. So when we began our journey, one of the things we charted was really a brief history of global policy instruments relating to plastics pollution. And that started with the London Convention, which was the Convention on the Prevention of Marine Pollution and Dumping of Wastes and Other Matter, and that was in 1975. Since then, there have been several additional uh, global um, uh, agreements and regulatory frameworks and conventions, as well as codes of conduct for the responsible handling of different marine-based uh, instruments and marine-based activities, like fishing, for example, and like the trans-border trade in waste. Now, these uh, collectively have all created a range of different instruments, which as member countries, African nations, for example, can get access to these instruments, can get advice on these instruments. And of course, uh, that's a key part of what we're trying to do through this seminar series. But uh, for us to take a stock of what the gaps were in these particular uh, different kinds of uh, frameworks, we really had to think very carefully about, okay, what does newer economic theory have to say about all of these things? Regulation has been around for time immemorial, but microeconomic theory in particular, which deals with the economics of the household and the economics of the firm, has really progressed in leaps and bounds the last 25 years with the development of behavioral economics. And when we scanned all of these different uh, frameworks, we found that they were very often uh, very strong command and control type instruments, not always very strong market friendly instruments though. And as a consequence, we thought, well, we also have to combine both command and control as well as market-based instruments for environmental regulation. And then beyond that, we need to incorporate what we have now begun to learn as a crucial part of microeconomic theory, which is that behavior matters and incentives matter to stakeholders. So 
that was our assessment of where we could make a contribution as a range of academics from around the world, all uh, specializing in different aspects of microeconomics, but uh, also aware of the fact that um, this advancement in behavioral theory, uh, which interacts a lot with social psychology and sociology and anthropology, especially in uh, poorer nations, where these uh, insights perhaps existed. So we distinguish between four broad types of economic policy instruments. The first was price-based instruments. The second was rights-based rights instruments. The third, regulation. And the fourth, the behavioral instrument. Now, price-based instruments are those where you change the relative price of goods or inputs associated with plastic pollution, either by taxing them or subsidizing alternatives or thinking about less pollution of other goods and inputs. On the other hand, rights-based instruments in which an instrument like a total allowable quantity of pollution is determined and trading pollution rights is allowed to minimize the cost of pollution reductions. We've seen a lot of this with respect to carbon emissions and this idea of being able to trade uh, a total allowable quantity of pollution is very much embedded in current thinking about uh, optimal design of environmental uh, rights-based instruments. The third option is regulation, and that would be directly where, for example, we determine a, an allowable pollution level. Often this has seen um, very dramatic command and control instruments, such as plastic bag bans, uh, which don't always work and sometimes uh, just encourage the movement of plastics into other territories. Uh, here we're concerned about issues such as if one country in Africa imposes a ban on plastic bags, how would that affect the neighboring countries? How would that affect smuggling and illegal uh, importation of plastic bags and the like? And then the fourth was uh, the behavioral instruments, which is where we try and think of how do people's social preferences and or cognitive limitations influence the behavior in favor of lower plastic pollution? So can we nudge consumers with some incentives in order to induce a form of behavioral change. We've seen uh, a lot of ocean plastics uh, initiatives being very successful in places as diverse as Hawaii, where um, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association of America, implemented some education programs at schools and found that that had a very strong impact upon the behavior of parents. And this is the kind of published work around plastics use and around behavioral nudges that we were keen to elaborate on so that in developing countries, this became very uh, familiar to policymakers so that they could uh, think about these kinds of interventions. Of course, a complex problem like plastic pollution, which comes from multiple sources, uh, is often uh, something that requires a mix of policy instruments. And so the framework that we sought to develop uh, had to combine different instruments so that policymakers could opt to have several of them um, at one time. We also consequently need to think about both the direct effects of certain policy instruments on the outcome of choice and the indirect effects. In other words, are there any negative repercussions that exist because of a particular intervention uh, so that we don't design policies um, that have high levels of what we call externalities or unintended effects. So the first task that we were forced to uh, engage with was then, okay, what do we see as um, the uh, impact pathway of marine plastics pollution, starting from the uh, development of virgin plastic materials? And what we did was we designed almost the value chain uh, of how plastics works from production through to consumption and disposal, while at the same time thinking of the uh, legal and illegal forms of disposal. So trying to bring that directly into our understanding of how this effective value chain works. We see from this diagram then that we start off at the production of virgin materials, with uh, different kinds of plastics uh, in their base level. And this really can be to any plastics polymer, right? It really doesn't matter which, we're just talking about the production of virgin materials. 
um, from the way in which they are um, synthetically manufactured, um, then the way in which they developed into secondary products, and those products are then used uh, for consumption. Now, consumption has both land-based sources and marine-based sources. And here, some important stakeholders include for land-based sources, industry, households, institutions like schools, hospitals, prisons, and government. Um, Marine-based consumption sources have important stakeholders like recreational and commercial fishing industry, aquaculture, and offshore oil and gas exploration. Now, in addition to these two major forms of consumption, uh, or major locations of consumption, we also had to recognize the effect that catastrophes had, um, both natural and man-made, on transporting plastics uh, from a desired level of terrestrial environment, such as any neighborhood in a city or town, through to the ocean or through to riverways which transported the plastic through to ocean. And that's where catastrophes such as floods uh, or any other man-made catastrophe can help um, ensure that uh, plastics leave uh, the sort of controlled environment that unfortunately end up in uh, the oceans. So then disposal was the one thing we had to think about very carefully because here we were all about, okay, there needs to be everything from um, leakages out of uh, direct production, such as lost resin pellets that perhaps get washed down a drain. Um, we had to think of, uh, in terms of legal disposal, the degree of waste beneficiation that takes place in the country, landfills, uh, if they exist at all, um, wastewater and sewage overflow. Now, these all have potential leakages into the ocean if they're not treated well, and if they don't have uh, sufficient controls. So uh, that is one way in which even if you have legal control of disposal of uh, the entire value chain's production, you can still find leakages. Of course, in developing countries, the major issue is illegal disposal, unfortunately, because poorer countries often do not prioritize uh, municipal service refuse collection. So as a consequence, uh, you often find waste that gets dumped illegally, and that waste uh, can be transported either by air or by uh, rivers, into, um, into the ocean directly. We also get littering uh, by consumers that uh, leads to forms of uh, marine plastic pollution. And with this was basically then how we managed to capture this idea of a full value chain from production to consumption through to disposal, as well as uh, leakages out of the system. Um, of course, if it was a closed, fully functioning system, we would see um, ocean plastic waste minimized. Uh, if it's not, we would see an increasing amount of illegal disposal. Uh, and in poor countries, this is often also because of the fact that you have large townships uh, and large informal settlements where there isn't formal refuse collection either. So uh, it's just a, it's a very important reality in trying to design uh, effective policy instruments to make a difference. Okay, so then when we thought about how do we begin to think about which policy goals should be developed in order to ensure that we maximized the reduction of marine plastic pollution based on the impact pathway of plastics. Now this is going to always, it's going to differ by country, but the basic principle is you think about exactly where your plastics are being produced if you have a domestic plastic production capability, then you have to think about your entire value chain. So pollution from pellets in the plastic industry is one thing that you have to monitor and try and get the plastics producers themselves to minimize, right? So here, we would see that the policy goal would be a reduction in the number of micro pellets lost to transport and production and technological improvements in the production process to better match expected use with end of life uses and reuses and decomposition. But note that these, this pollution from pellets in the plastic industry doesn't always have regulation associated with it. It may do in certain countries, uh, especially European countries, but often in developing countries that isn't there. But this often also comes about because of the fact that you have many micro enterprises involved uh, in either the use and or production of, micro, of, of plastics, 
and that these plastics then uh, are very difficult to, um, to regulate these plastics producers. If you have a large uh, proportion of micro enterprises, that is. Um, then we have to think about, okay, what about uh, wealthier countries which have a higher consumption of plastics? And we have to think about what were the average levels of plastics consumption globally? How does this vary across uh, developed and developing countries? And I'll show you some data on that um, in a few slides. The policy goals here, if you're trying to reduce high consumption of plastics, is to foster sustainable consumption patterns, starting by reducing single-use plastics. Uh, if we're thinking of lower levels of legal disposal, then we can think of uh, effectively three different uh, policy goals, and they are related to water being legally disposed but not treated, waste being legally disposed but leakages from landfills and dump sites taking place, and insufficient waste beneficiation. By waste beneficiation, I mean recycling, uh, reuse, uh, or alternatively, um, waste to energy technology. Now, the policy goals with water not being legally disposed of properly is to build water treatment facilities that increase plastic recovery. So the right kinds of filtration devices, etc. This could be anywhere up to a municipal level goal. So it's very important that at a decentralized level to national government, um, one also thinks uh, about that level. When it comes to um, legally disposed uh, but leakages from land sites, landfills and dump sites, then one of the things is to improve landfill technology, improve collection infrastructure. Uh, and again, depending on whether a private sector is engaged with the public sector to do this, you may find that uh, this is easier to achieve or not. And then lastly, in terms of low levels of legal disposal, the policy goal when you have insufficient waste beneficiation is to increase demand uh, from the plastic industry and to promote recycling and waste beneficiation more broadly. Um, I've been involved in some work with the Asian Development Bank to think about new technologies that can be implemented in the Asia region to try and initially get rid of some of uh, the massive plastic waste uh, um, stockpiles in Asia. And here, things like waste to energy technologies, although far from ideal, uh, are being considered just because of the sheer volumes uh, of waste and plastic waste in particular that are there. So again, sometimes not the best solution, but it's the optimal, meaning least cost, most efficacious solution. And then most importantly, perhaps for many developing countries, is this uh, question of illegal disposal of plastics. And here we say, we kind of define this by saying more than 20% of plastics is inadequately managed in uh, the economy or in the country. Here, the goal is to move towards legal disposal of plastics in some way, shape or form. Now, this might again be through encouraging public-private partnerships with private waste providers. That often does require recyclers as well. So we get into a virtuous loop potentially of helping to build uh, the recycling value chain and the waste beneficiation value chain while at the same time moving to in reduce the amount of illegal disposal and provide forms of cheap but um, accessible waste collection services where separation at source is really the key thing that you want to move to once you've got an adequate um, waste collection system. So obviously a broad range of policy goals and each country will vary depending on the level of plastic production in their country all the way through to the level and uh, amount of plastic consumption that's there. The existing frameworks in terms of whether they collect waste or not, this is all going to also impact the starting point for setting policy goals to reduce marine plastic pollution. So then what we developed is this key idea called the problem-based selection tool. Meaning if we know that, uh, for example, a country uh, needs to target the plastic industry, then we can think of price-based instruments such as a tax on environmental performance of the plastic products. Or alternatively, subsidies for research and innovation. We can also think of rights-based instruments like extended producer responsibility initiatives and whether those in fact should either be legislated or voluntary. Um, in South Africa, we've got examples of both and in the plastics industry, 
we have seen uh, a tremendous lead taken by um, the plastics producers themselves to generate extended producer responsibility, uh, which I believe um, has been discussed in some detail earlier in this uh, seminar series. Regulation instruments for the plastic industry uh, include things like standards for pelletization, also for spills uh, to or made by the industry and responsibility for cleanup. And then uh, importantly on the behavioral instruments, we also talk a bit about what those are at the plastic production side. And that includes information provision, um, nudging such as setting defaults to no plastics, or the use of social comparisons. In other words, making it clear to the production uh, uh, sectors of plastics, um, what kind of emissions they're causing, uh, what kind of uh, efficiency gains they can possibly get by looking at uh, examples of these industries in other countries, or even just more efficient um, firms within the same country. If on the other hand, we thought there was, let's say there was no uh, plastic production in a country, then one of the things we would look towards developing are targets for consumption of plastic files. Even if you produce no plastics, it's very likely uh, and it's um, almost a certainty that there will be a lot of uh, plastic consumption in the country. In that, in, in that case, your price-based instruments, rights-based instruments, regulation instruments, and behavioral instruments begin to change. At the consumption level for price-based instruments, we see an increase in the price of plastic products. We see defund, uh, deposit refund schemes for plastic bottles and waste charges. Right? So these are all things that we know of, but it's important to be aware of how they target consumption in this instance, rather than production. For rights-based instruments, we see waste-based billing, for example, so if the country has the capability, uh, one thing that municipalities can do is to introduce fees on uh, waste and collection rates. Regulation industries include things like bans. Here we've seen uh, single-use plastic bans, uh, light plastic bags, for example, or alternatively creating plastic bags that can be reused. The life cycle of plastic bags has received a lot of attention. And uh, very interesting findings there, showing that if you use a plastic bag at least um, twice, then its life cycle impact can, in fact, be lower than a paper bag. So a lot of information here to help people understand uh, just how to use some of uh, plastics in a way that is um, more beneficial to the environment. Then lastly, uh, mandatory recycling. Um, where it's possible to regulate this, uh, it's often uh, something that can uh, be a very successful instrument. On the behavioral side, here we see that information provision is such a key initiative. And this uh, is taking all that information around kids' behavior, kids' behavior at schools, um, education programs, and how to uh, alter preferences um, of the parents through their kids. Uh, it's also directly for consumers, um, such as seeing campaigns for zero plastics and the use of social comparisons and explicit uses of social norms. So trying to get people to become aware of the fact that their actual disposal of plastic matters, that a social norm where plastic disposal for recycling is seen as the most advantageous um, form of consumer behavior for disposal is something to promote. And all kinds of campaigns have been used to try and nudge consumers to be more conscious of the disposal of their waste. Uh, then lastly, when it comes to targeting the disposal of plastics, this depends very much on um, exactly uh, the, what kind of waste infrastructure is in a particular country. You can get waste-based pricing mechanisms, you can get subsidizing, uh, be subsidies for appropriate behavior, and this all depends on um, the level of infrastructure in the country to enable this. Rights-based instruments, once again, include extended producer responsibility, um, pay-as-you-throw schemes, provision of waste collection that promotes separation of waste for recycling. Um, regulation instruments include things like banning uh, landfills or having zero waste-to-landfill policies. 
uh, much of those kinds of policies exist in Europe at the moment. Um, and uh, the success, though, is varied in the developing world. Also, mandatory recycling laws. And then here on the behavioral instruments, we see again the importance of education campaigns, information appealing to social and personal norms, not to throw litter on the street, not to throw litter out your car door or window. Um, all of those kinds of uh, campaigns are important. Door-to-door uh, -door information provision often can be done uh, with rights-based groups or through municipalities and face-to-face -face information facilitating the adoption of recycling. Here, uh, examples would include major retailers, for example, taking on the responsibility to bring uh, awareness to their consumers of the need to uh, consume less plastic. So if we combine all of these together, uh, we start seeing uh, the impact pathway of plastics on the left-hand side and the instruments on the right-hand side here. And this is just to give you a sense now of how uh, we're pulling everything together and how our different policy instruments for production, consumption, and disposal match our impact pathway of plastics. You can see here uh, from the production side, the goal is to reduce the amount and uh, quality of plastic generated, um, I think that's supposed to be quantity of plastics are generated, my apologies. Uh, and that uh, very much impacts this pre-production of pallets, manufacturing of plastic products, etc. Right, And then we bring in our four different types of uh, price, uh, sorry, policy instruments. And those are regulation, technological, economic, and behavioral. And again, this impacts upon the production side. Uh, on the consumption side, our goal here is to reduce the amount of plastic consumed and disposed, and that includes uh, all of the consumption, land-based, marine-based, and uh, catastrophic uh, outcomes. And then lastly, for disposal, our aim is to promote proper disposal, recycling, and to reduce leakages, and that's uh, very much what we're talking about in this side of our impact pathway. So by combining this impact pathway then, with a set of interventions around production, consumption, and disposal, we have the template to apply this to any country, right? And depending on what percentage of plastics are produced in that country, um, how much consumption of plastics is taking place, and whether disposal is, uh, is, is very efficient or not, we can tailor the pathway uh, and policy instruments to the country. And this is precisely what we've done here in this table. So we had all of the researchers um, from the Environment for Development Centers in India, Vietnam, South Africa, Tanzania, Costa Rica, and uh, Chile um, populate this table with data. And our objective here was to say, if we take production, consumption, and disposal, and we split it into a few key indicators, how much does that inform us about where crucial policy instruments need to be made? So let me give you an example of how to interpret this table. In South Africa, we do produce a lot of plastic, but the balance of trade for the plastic industry shows that we were still uh, consuming more than we were in total. This is not uh, differentiated for different plastic polymers. There are certain plastic polymers where we are net exporting. Um, we then try to look at the share of microenterprises in the plastic industry just by number. In other words, uh, one large producer would be considered the same as one small producer. So we're trying to get an estimate of the market structure. Um, on the consumption side, South Africa has a very high consumption rate. You can see it's higher than the world average. And that's an important um, indicator of uh, just what's going on in South Africa. Costa Rica shares a similar consumption statistic. Um, then, in terms of disposal, 54% of our waste is, our plastic waste is, a, is inadequately managed. Um, the share of waste water treated is about 57%. The share of waste uh, collected legally is unfortunately only 64%. And the share of plastic that is received is 43.7%, which is very high uh, in the sense that it compares quite favorably to the top 10 countries in the world and is uh, more than double the world average. Now, given that that's the kind of information that South Africa faces, 
The question would then be, if we go back to our impact pathway, where should South Africa concentrate its resources and its new policy-based instruments? Okay? And this is where we start using the data here to inform the choice of policy. We can see there are a few key things which are important for South Africa to control. Firstly, we are only collecting about 64% of waste legally. That means if we move into this impact pathway, we have 36% of our waste being illegally disposed. Now that's through both illegal dumping and littering. We know that in townships in South Africa, there's massive stockpiles of waste because it is not collected by many municipalities. That major stockpiling of waste uh, just increases the amount of through flow of that waste through to the ocean. And it is a disaster, right? So one of our most important interventions for South Africa is to try and drive this number, 64%, up closer to uh, 100%. We can see that another middle-income country like South Africa is Chile. Chile, for example, has 96% of their waste legally collected. So if we try and apply this uh, impact pathway to Chile, it's completely different to South Africa because they won't have the same problems here. Instead, for Chile, the question is going to be, how do they develop increased waste beneficiation, increase uh, reduced leakages out of landfill and dump sites, and with waste water? On the other hand, let's have a look at Tanzania. Tanzania has a deficit in the sense that it's a net importer of plastic. Uh, we didn't have data on the share of microenterprises there, but plastic consumption is very low. In fact, it's the lowest of all the countries in the sample, and this is partly because of the fact that many people are purchasing not just from formal retail stores, but in the informal sector from agricultural traders and the like. The share of plastic that's inadequately managed is huge, and this is partly related to the fact that the amount of, um, of waste collected formally in Tanzania is only 15.6%. So if we go back to this impact pathway here, we know illegal disposal in Tanzania is going to be by far the majority of what's happening to waste collection efforts there. Consequently, a major, uh, a major focus would then be to move towards things like regulation so that the state introduces um, regulation on the consumption and disposal of plastics, partly because there isn't a well-developed um, waste disposal industry there. And waste collection, even in large cities like Dar es Salaam, is almost non-existent for many of the city's inhabitants. So we can see here that if we use uh, this impact pathway and think very carefully about the data associated with each country in terms of these three domains, production, consumption, and disposal, we can tailor the instruments that are available to us in terms of policies and behavioral nudges to maximize the impact of the interventions on the actual reduction of marine debris and plastics pollution. And that's the goal, because if we can choose the right policy instruments, we can lower the cost and the impacts of failed policies, right, which possibly just add to the problem, and we can increase the efficacy of the intervention. And that is the crucial part of what we'd like to land here with this framework for countries, is that you don't have to be a wealthy country. Things like behavioral nudges can be uh, developed with, with minimal cost uh, and can have far reaching implications. You work through schools and education campaigns, for example, have one of the sort of highest levels of behavioral change in households, given the fact that the kids are interacting with their parents. You can do the same thing with government procurement as a completely different option. If all your government procurement starts putting rules about disposal and use of plastics, you can have far reaching implications. So this instrument really is tailored towards any country. It's not the fact that you have to be wealthy, you can be any government and you can choose these particular instruments to suit your country and uh, your budgets.
In conclusion then, uh, I'd just like to make a few additional points. And the first is that no one is denying that plastics pollution in the ocean is a complex problem. Uh, and it's going to require a mix of different policy instruments. It's going to require an engagement of stakeholders from your producers, your consumers, uh, and different uh, forms of waste beneficiation industries. If there are no waste beneficiation industries to start with, you might want to have the state taking a lead in building a few uh, waste treatment plants or alternatively waste to energy facilities that take into account uh, modern advances in technology to try and deal with uh, some of the extant waste that is existing in people's environments. Of course, waste is something that reduces human health. So by investing in these kinds of efforts, you also potentially improve uh, human health for the communities that are surrounded by the, by the waste. The framework is flexible enough to be used for any country, right, or regions within countries, whether they are decentralized regions like municipalities and district councils, or uh, at a higher level of aggregation like provinces. Now, the importance here is that, you know, many countries in Africa uh, are also federal states. Uh, and so as a consequence, uh, the states or provinces have a lot of the uh, authority over waste and waste and how waste disposal is treated. Under those circumstances, you just want to tailor the framework in order to adapt it to the regulatory structures of a given um, political governance regime. Now, very important here is things like behavioral nudges, they can apply uh, at any scale. Uh, they often require um, things that are very simple to intervene with, and uh, they can shape um, behavior in a very powerful way. Um, Something else to think about here is that if done correctly, public-private partnerships with respect to waste disposal, treatment, recycling, and waste beneficiation can be tremendously successful. Uh, one can use the fact that waste exists to uh, spark an entire new form of industrialization based on waste cleanup. Because the technologies are so diverse and sometimes quite advanced in terms of their manufacturing capabilities, building waste treatment plants, building waste beneficiation plants um, as proofs of concept in combination with the private sector can often help to uh, develop skills in the sector and get locals to become uh, aware of technologies that are worth investing in to help this. So it can be a tremendous catalyst into actual micro-enterprise development and larger firms and, and larger technologies used to treat waste. Remember, uh, in many poor countries, there's always a cry that we don't have data. So in this instance, do what has to be done. Start small, find out what works, scale up, right? This is the principle we want to use here. There's no reason not to commence interventions immediately, regardless of your budget constraints. Then lastly, some limitations of this work and directions for future research. Um, most of the literature we found uh, when we tried to compile this, the reason that this project took so long, we were busy with it from 2018 all the way through to 2020, was because a lot of the literature focuses on understanding the behavior of individuals or households, while little attention is devoted to understanding the behavior of a broader group of consumers. Uh, particularly institutional consumers like hospitals, schools, universities, and government. Here, one of the things we wanted to bring to the attention of institutional consumers is to think about the fact that your procurement behavior matters. Uh, schools are often controlled at a sort of more aggregate level than just one school. Yes, you have private schools, but you have lots of government schools. And if there are rules on procurement, rules on littering, rules on how to uh, incentivize uh, more sustainable um, consumption and disposal habits, then those can be easily uh, affected with behavioral nudges such as education campaigns. The other thing we found was that although there is vast evidence regarding the importance of personal norms for individual behavior, uh, most behavioral interventions rely on one-shot information provision, while long-run interventions in the form of environmental education is more scarce. Now, this is an important principle, uh, again, around the idea of inculcating an ethic of 
environmental stewardship for individuals, even if they live in poor communities. Uh, in economics, there's a principle called the discount rate, which really has to do with the fact of how people plan for the future. We know that poor people have very high discount rates because they often can't think about uh, the future's environment if they can't put food on the table today. We do know this, but that is not an excuse for not introducing interventions specifically targeted at poor communities, where often we have the most disastrous consequences of waste and therefore need to make the strongest interventions. Again here, uh, examples are around, um, and in South Africa, we're also working with Polico, one of the EPROs in the plastics industry, to try and trial different interventions in these poor communities, but we can alter behavior there also, and try and inculcate a more long-term form of environmental consciousness for, um, for uh, residents of those areas. Finally, uh, although marine plastics pollution has both a land and a marine based uh, sources, studies of the effectiveness of policy instruments targeting actors in the latter category, in other words, the marine based sources in particular, such as with uh, small scale fishermen and aquaculture companies, fishing communities, fishing, um, larger fishing companies and tourists are absent. Very frequently, uh, these are the day to day users of the ocean. Uh, as a consequence, their use and behavior matters. Uh, what they do with their fishing nets, their lines, their equipment, uh, their litter, uh, all of those have an impact upon the, de the degree of marine plastics pollution. And it requires um, interventions there also from low cost ones, such as behavioral intervention, to uh, more important, uh, perhaps in, in a regulatory dimension, um, in terms of how to deal with discarded equipment, all of those interventions are necessary there too. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for bearing with me through it. Um, as I said, this is based on a paper which I have circulated to the conference organizers and you're welcome to email me for a copy of it and send me any questions or comments. I'm also of course uh, available now in the chat session to uh, answer any questions that the audience may have. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Reza. Um, I don't see any questions and answers in the chat yet, um, but please feel free to send those through. Uh, in the meantime, I see Tony has his hand raised. Tony? Yes, it's because my question or my comment is too long for me to write. Um, and I wanted to listen to Reza rather than write. <laughs> Risa, I'm going to put a sort of a theory to you. And that is if you have a look at production and you have a, a look at consumption and then at disposal, you'll find, I think, that production is actually very successful. So successful that it produces a product that's actually really cheap which means that by the time it gets onto the market, it is actually really easily affordable and, and therefore it's bought at low cost. And part of the efficiency of that is that during production, they are incredibly efficient. They employ a large number of people. Their waste is very limited. And if they do have waste, for example, in the, um, you mentioned pellets and so forth. There's Operation Clean Sweep, which makes sure that in the vehicles, in the trucks, in the airplanes, in the factories, they sweep everything up and they put it back in to the system. And so there's very little by way of loss there. And so there's efficiency, there's high employment, there's much lower impact on greenhouse gas emissions, etc. And then it comes ultimately to the retailer who, despite putting up some sort of profit into it, still produces a material that is ultimately quite cheap. And you mentioned, I'll just give you an example of this. If you were to compare the real costs of a plastic bag versus a paper bag, you would find that the paper bag cost in monetary terms and also in environmental terms is a lot higher than that of the plastic bag. 
Um, so there's a tendency to look to go for it. So now this means when it gets past this efficient, effective, well-managed, business-like approach, the, the producer, the producer, the retail retailer passes it on to the consumer, and the consumer now has a cheap product, and it's not worth the consumer's while to do much with it. You mentioned packaging. One might not need a packaging system if plastics that went into the waste streams were really at a higher value than they are now. One of the big problems we have with waste is that there aren't really as many enterprises as they should as they should be. Imagine a scenario where the enterprises were competing with each other for the valuable waste resources. The incentives then to collect would be tremendous and there would be virtually no cost to waste management. So once it becomes waste, that efficiency is lost, the costs of action are high, the costs of return are low. And so my, my thesis here, I guess it took me a long time to get there, but my thesis is essentially that plastics go onto the market cheap, they come off the market cheap, and we really, to manage waste, and now this is a biologist speaking to an economist, so I'm way out of my league, um, but basically, essentially, plastics are too cheap, and therefore they're difficult and costly to manage. Is there anything from an economic perspective that would make sense in changing that formula? Assuming that my formula is correct, or is it a biologist making an enormous mistake? Okay, thanks uh, for that, Tony. And um, there were there were several important comments you made, and um, and then the question at the end. And uh, I'm going to deal with the question at the end in the most depth because I think it's uh, it's an important question, and it's at the heart of uh, the microeconomics of plastic production. And and your question uh, really is around: it, Are plastics too cheap? Are they too cheap to produce? which then uh, makes them cheap to use and cheap to dispose of. And the short answer to that is yes. Um, yes, to the extent that uh, any time that the environmental consequences of a good are not factored into the price of the production of that good, then the price is in theory too low from a microeconomic point of view, because you're not incorporating the full costs of the actual product into the um, into the cost of production, right? And as a consequence, you're distorting the price. Now, if you were to draw this on a blackboard, you would have a demand and a supply curve uh, where the intersection point would be below what's the actual uh, market clearing price because you're not taking into account the costs of disposal. Now, unfortunately, um, that's been happening for almost the last 300 years since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. And it's not just plastics that have been underpriced, it's almost every commodity because we have not been incorporating the environmental consequences of our production decisions into the manufacturing prices of all goods, right? From steel through to iron ore, through to mining, through to uh, textiles, through to plastics, through to every other form of manufactured product. We just have never adequately priced the environmental consequences into that. And for the first time now, because of the developments in uh, with things like the system of an integrated environmental and economic accounts, we're beginning to include natural capital accounts and natural capital accounting into our overall system of understanding what economies are dealing with from the, from the perspective of the actual resources. And the hope is that this will lead to corrections in pricing. For now, we have these haphazard and piecemeal corrections to pricing, such as uh, the carbon tax, for example, which is designed as a generic policy instrument to try and correct for the fact that all industries have been systematically underpricing uh, the manufacturing of their goods. Now, we're still very much in the infancy of understanding how carbon pricing works for a variety of different industries. 
but it's a potentially far-reaching initiative um, when it comes to inflating the price in order to reflect the actual long-term environmental consequences of production and consumption. So the short answer to your question is yes, plastics have been underpriced. So have almost all other commodities. Uh, that is a failure of microeconomic pricing to not take into account the environmental consequences of the goods that we produce. Uh, and we are in a massive scramble as a global community to try and find solutions for that. Um, so there's no quick question uh, to answer this one other than to talk you through the kinds of initiatives like carbon taxes and other forms of uh, um, initiatives that have been designed to make a start at the Thanks for the question. May, may I follow up then? Um, it seems as though it's exceedingly difficult to correct because as soon as you start to um, manipulate the end, the price of the end product in this way, it might then render many of the industries and factories and so forth uneconomical. And if they're not viable, then one has employment losses, one lo loses these. Uh, 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 and again, I I'm talking to you as a biologist. So for me, I could see that then it might end the streams of certain products, which might be quite based, quite valuable to, to people. So. Uh, and the values as well. In everything we do, there have to be trade-offs. Nothing's going to be perfect. Um, and so, so how does one actually deal with this? Because it is important that all the benefits of plastics should be retained, um, but in the hope that they're not going to cause the negatives which we actually currently see. Uh, and that those negatives, you know, it, those negatives are enormous, and that's what people are focusing on. They're not focusing on the positives on the sort of production, manufacturing, or conversion side, and everything that's happening there. So we're looking at we're looking at penalising the efficient part because of the inefficiencies in in the waste management. So so how does one do this without penalising? What is now construed by many people as being the wrong part. Basically, they say, oh, the, the, the problem lies with the manufacturers and the producers, etc. Well, maybe to some extent it does, but maybe it's it's past that. Maybe that's not the problem. Okay. So the way a carbon tax would work, um, in theory, if you were to design it directly, is that it would take into account the life cycle costs of production of each commodity and uh, the carbon footprint imposed by that commodity's production. And then it would price uh, according to mitigation measures, measures that were known to be able to reduce that carbon impact. Um, so if your carbon tax was working completely efficiently, there really wouldn't be a need for other interventions. Of course, uh, that's a very disputed uh, science because trying to understand the life cycle impacts of a production process are data intensive and complex and frequently the kinds of life cycle tables that you need um, aren't always easily accessible to policymakers in particular. But uh, it can and has been done uh, in South Africa and elsewhere in the world as well. Um, the other thing is you can introduce different types of interventions at different parts of the plastics value chain. If you do believe that there is an efficient part, to use your words, such as the production side, right, and a slightly less efficient part, which you might think of as uh, the disposal side, since we only collect 64% of our waste in South Africa, um, then it implies that uh, the focus areas for policymakers are where we are, where we are least efficient. Right? In other words, policymakers should direct their attention there. Now, it's incumbent upon um, the, the policy community, but also the research community, to, to guide policymakers there with respect to uh, the kinds of interventions that they can make, so that anything that is working uh, less than optimally or less efficiently um, is, in fact, uh, dealt with. 
Now, remember also that if, if plastic production is dominated by a single player and it's, uh, and it's a monopoly market, which in some countries it is, the whole point of our paper here was to put uh, the entire value chain on the table and to develop an impact pathway uh, that could list the instruments that would target each part of that value chain, right? So uh, a lot of what you're talking about in terms of the plastic industry is true for South Africa, um, but you also get large plastic producers elsewhere in the world, which um, use their market power as a form of dominance. Under those conditions, you'd want competition policy to play a role in trying to think about, are they overpricing? Are they underpricing? Are they in fact colluding to distort the market? Uh, you know, because you can often find underpricing um, uh, in certain monopoly markets in order to increase use and drive out competitors. So uh, it is a matter of empirical investigation for each country. Uh, that's, I guess, the point I'm trying to make. The point of this paper was that once you understand a particular country's environment in terms of production, consumption, and disposal, you can tailor the instruments um, that we discussed to the advantage of the country so that if you were to develop an action plan, that action plan would then be individually specific to the country's needs, right? So South Africa would have a particular uh, action plan that would look very different to Tanzania, given the data that I showed you about Tanzania. And exactly the same thing would apply between uh, Tanzania and Costa Rica or, or Chile or anywhere else. So I suppose what the contribution we were trying to make in this uh, paper is to say, it doesn't really matter whether you have a monopoly producer uh, of plastics, whether in fact you have lots and lots of small micro enterprises um, or some combination in between, there is a set of policy instruments you can apply regardless of your market structure at the production level. Similarly, a set of policy instruments you can apply regardless of whether your consumption of plastic is high like South Africa or low like Tanzania. Um, but you can choose from those policy instruments so that it is relevant to your country's circumstances. And then finally, disposal. One last thing I just wanna say about disposal is this idea that um, waste is uh, a sort of missing market or waste is um, some form of underutilized resource. Waste is in fact a commodity, right? It, it's a commodity that can be utilized in an entirely new production process with new technologies that can be, a, uh, you know, uh, it can convert waste to energy. As we know, we can also um, uh, look at many different uses of that waste. So what that represents to countries is an opportunity. Uh, it's an opportunity to develop a waste beneficiation set of industries with public and private sector participation that can spur an entirely new form of sustainable manufacturing and uh, advanced recycling capabilities. And this is the reason why poor countries in African nations need to get on board because there are so many opportunities to use waste as a form of industrial development and building capabilities in local manufacturing that I think is just, it's just not sufficiently recognized as um, a pathway out of poverty and a pathway towards um, industrialization in a green form of uh, industrialization or green growth platform. Uh, I teach a lot of this kind of idea in my economic growth course in the master's program at the University of Cape Town, partly because what we're trying to get people to understand about green growth is the fact that it's not just the development of advanced technologies in solar, wind and renewables, it's actually recognizing where we've underpriced before, where stockpiles of waste such as landfills represent sort of free commodities almost because they've been disposed of, free commodities to use as inputs uh, into a manufacturing process or a potential manufacturing company. So these are the ideas we also want to get across, which is that waste has value and that with the right form of incentives and policies, you can catalyze that value, or alternatively, if you get those policies wrong or you do nothing, you lose all that value, right? The waste is a resource. It is stockpiled 
it is highly valuable if you know how to leverage it and how to unlock that value. Often it requires the use of the private sector with the public sector to catalyze that sector and initiate it so that it can start delivering the long-term benefits that we know it can. But that also requires a change uh, in viewpoint of policymakers to recognize its uh, potential long-term value. And there'll always be a supply of waste. That's the other thing, right? There'll always be a supply of waste. So consequently, building capabilities to deal with that waste um, has tremendous long-term value in my view. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, it's, it's still me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> one of the things that I've been concerned about lately, looking at Africa, and, and we heard in Linda's Godfrey's talk that, uh, and you can get it by reading the Africa Waste Management Outlook, that only 4% of plastic, or, or only 4% of waste is, is, I think it's plastic waste, is recycled in Africa. And in a way, that means that waste has no value because until somebody's going to buy it, it's valueless. And they're not going to buy it and run an enterprise until they have a market, which again gives it a value in terms of the end market. So that being the case, it's not the policies so much as entrepreneurs not recognizing that there are entrepreneurial opportunities and not recognizing that there are markets that could take advantage of those opportunities. And so the issue then is that we need to find small scale because if we take large scale aspects, the, the capital investment and the return is just something that you can't, can't manage, particularly in small countries that don't have the volumes. So we need to find small scale entrepreneurial opportunities that can be duplicated and spread throughout Africa and for which there would be markets and those end markets would need to be the sorts of things that are valuable to the people of Africa. Clearly that's different from what might be the situation in Europe or North America, et cetera. So that to me, the big issue is um, developing those entrepreneurial opportunities, but also to fulfill market gaps, because otherwise, while plastics has the potential to have value, it doesn't have value until those actually exist. Or, or again, is this a silly biologist? Um, no, so I think I agree with you uh, wholeheartedly. Uh, the point is that, um, and one of the things you correct to identify is that you know, entrepreneurs will enter into an industry if there are profitable opportunities uh, to do business, and they won't if they are not profitable opportunities. So I just want to take a step back from that and then just talk about, well, what's the enabling environment required in order for you to have uh, a waste beneficiation industry? First, uh, you need to be collecting that waste, right? So it almost starts at the level of actual um, initiating waste management services. The other thing you often need to do is you need to give waste a price, right? Waste is often thought of as dead capital until you give it a price. And you can only give it a price once uh, there is some form of enabling environment that recognizes it as a property right worth trading. In South Africa, that enabling environment is the national Environmental Management Waste Act and the various types of waste management instruments that it has enabled in South Africa. So much so that we've got everything from extended producer responsibility organizations through to plastic bags taxes, through to carbon taxes, etc. But if you didn't have that enabling legislative environment, you wouldn't be allocating the property right to waste so that we knew how, who to trade it and how to trade it and you wouldn't, uh, and you would artificially then suppress the pricing of waste. And that means your entire waste management value chain would collapse. Now, let's take a step back from that and think about how then do we create such an enabling environment? Many African countries don't have that basic foundational legislation on environmental management of waste. 
And that would then be one of the first places to start from a strict policy and or regulatory point of view, create national legislation to enable the trade of waste and the involvement of the private sector. And, and then you start creating conditions favorable for entrepreneurship. So I do agree with you on your points there, Tony, but I do think that there are um, immediate uh, solutions to help catalyze the development of the waste management industry. And in my view, that involves both the public and the private sector. Thank you very much. Um, Tara, I, I think that's back to you now. Thanks, thanks, Tony, and thanks, Reza, for, for the detailed answers. Uh, I still don't see any questions in the Q&A box yet, um, but Reza, I wonder, um, in, in the diagram that you showed um, that took us through the, the impact pathways and instruments, um, would you mind just uh, maybe indicating if, if a country were to implement a plastic ban, for example, to try and manage plastic waste, could you maybe explain how an example such as that would, in, would be influenced um, by the impact pathways? Well, okay, let's go back into the idea of the impact pathway and how it works. Right? So this is pulling all of the diagrams above together into that impact pathway and uh, summarizing our instruments. So the first thing is a ban on plastic bags um, can be thought of as um, a ban on the production of plastic bags, and it can be thought of as a ban on the consumption of plastic bags. In both of those instances, those would be examples of regulation and enforcement. Okay, so just going back to uh, this particular diagram here, sorry, uh, going back to this particular diagram here, uh, it depends um, again on whether that bag is at the production side or the consumption side, but your policy goals here would be that you would think of a ban as helping to foster sustainable consumption patterns. So in this case, in South Africa with our plastic bags ban, we, um, or with our plastic bags tax, we thought it would reduce plastic bags. We saw that it did for a short time, and then people still uh, started using them by just paying the price for them. So it didn't have the long-term impact on our consumption that we hoped. Now, countries such as Kenya, for example, have experienced with a more dramatic policy goal, which is regulatory in nature. In other words, in this instance, it's affecting regulation which is point three here, directly aimed at reducing the use of plastic goals. So to try and foster sustainable consumption patterns. And that plastic bag ban, which was implemented there, unfortunately, instead of reducing the amount of illegal disposal, that just created a secondary um, market for plastic bags, which was illegal itself, and which involved importing plastic bags from neighboring countries. Now, because there wasn't any large-scale manufacturing of plastic bags, the plastic bag ban was not in the production side, it was in the consumption side. And then because a command and control instrument like a plastic bags ban has the potential to create all kinds of chaos um, if it's not done across a wide enough region, um, then all you're gonna do is see an increase in illegal importing of plastic bags and them being dumped as well, because now there isn't any recognized way of dealing with them. Uh, in South Africa, on the other hand, some of the uh, plastics retailers are themselves involved in trying to nudge consumers away from plastic bags and perhaps to more sustainable alternative bag types or the reuse of plastic bags. So that's an example when the retailer is involved in shifting consumers. Um, and we've done experiments here to see if uh, the plastic bags are on the till point or next to the till point compared to the reusable bags, do they increase people's uh, propensity to use plastics? And it seems they have done. So that would be an example of a retailer using a behavioral instrument in order to alter consumption patterns. Okay, so the ban on plastic bags is a consumption-based one. For example, the ban in Kenya. It is uh, a regulatory form of uh, instrument, policy instrument. 
and it's a very direct effect. The more subtle effect is the example in South Africa of uh, retailers here, like Pick and Pay and Woolworths, um, having either no plastic bags or alternatively availability of substitutes for the plastic bag. So those would be examples of how um, a plastic bag ban or a plastic bag behavioral incentive um, would fit into this impact path. Does that answer your question, Tara, or have I not managed to do that sufficiently? Uh, thank you. Thanks. I, 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 it does answer it. I was just wondering, um, because I know some countries have used that as a, as a way to try and manage the plastic issue. So I was just curious how that would um, work through, through the various pathways you outlined. Um, Thanks. I, just one, uh, one other point on that. So we know in Kenya that there have been some difficulties with the ban, but in some island nations, for example, in the South Pacific, uh, plastic, there have been bans on all single-use plastics. And this is partly because the island states are small states. The impact of single-use plastics like straws and uh, you know, everything else, um, including plastic bags, but also um, other sort of single-use plastics uh, are very immediate and the impact on the coastal ecology systems are very direct. So under those circumstances, it might be favorable for them to actually implement a single use plastic ban. And it won't have the same ramifications as a country like Kenya where there are many neighbors and you know, plastic bags are all uh, legally produced uh, there and consumed. And so they just find their way back into to Kenya. So again, if it's an island nation, they have to take into account their own unique characteristics, and they can often be a lot more successful uh, in uh, managing things like single-use plastics through command and control regulatory instruments like bans. Um, it's generally not particularly successful in countries that are parts of, you know, lots of contiguous um, adjacent countries, like in the continents of Africa or Europe or Latin America, etc. Uh, thank you, Riza. Uh, that's a. Sorry, uh, Mamadou, do, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, yeah. I just, um, first of all, thank you very much. This is uh, interesting. Um, and especially, you know, the framework. I mean, I would like just to. Um, recently, I've been talking to regular people in, uh, you know, um, Senegal, uh, Guinea, and uh, Mauritania in West Africa about some of these issues. But what came up to me, and I'm just trying to link, you know, some of the information that I have with, you know, with the, the framework that you shared with us right now. Um, when I talked to some of the people, they were saying, when, you know, when we talk about behavior, I mean, many of them said, you know, what's the point of changing behavior in an environment where actually, you know, you're dealing with a corrupt systems, you know, at different level, at the level of the municipality and sometimes even at the level of the government. So I'm just wondering in, in, in your framework, I mean, it's, it looks very nice and it, it does make sense in many ways, but there seems to be something missing in terms of just understanding the context itself, you know, um, and especially, you know, the, 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 the place of governance in all this. Uh, because, you know, um, and if, you, if we look at uh, many of these African countries, they seem to have serious issues with governance and in a, in a, in a context of bad governance, how can you, you know, especially when we are thinking about, you know, action plans, you know, now, you know, and, and, and strategies, you know, to make, I mean, the plans actually work. I just want to get, you know, some kind of comments um, from you about that. Um, and I, yes, I do see, you know, um, management of waste as a, you know, as a pathway out of poverty. Yeah, but you do that in a, in a context where you have a goodwill, a strong one from the from the leaders of the of the of the of the countries to to get to that point. So so right now I think it's uh, you know we're dealing with a. I'm just wondering. I would like to hear more about your uh, how do you see? I mean how how that can fit? How can you make it fit within the framework uh, as it is sure. right now? Sure, and and thank you very much uh, for that question. Um, I think it's a key one um, because. It's not just African countries that uh, have this problem, right? It's uh, countries all over the world and developing countries all over the world. Um, the advantage of uh, the network that I was involved 
uh, with that wrote this paper is that there are people from uh, they were from India, China, Latin America as well. Um, and, and everybody is aware of the fact that corruption exists in all of those countries at different levels. So one of the things that I did want to show you about how it could impact upon uh, or, or how this framework can take it into account is as follows. So let's say here that in order to have a capable, uh, if you had a capable state, things like rights-based instruments and regulation, for example, those are things that uh, might be difficult to implement well, because there might be some form of, of capture of the actual instrument. So if you, if you raise a tax, a tax uh, might be collected in some way, which is not um, beneficial to the fiscus. It might uh, have corrupt politicians trying to take a share of it or something of that nature. If you're thinking about this particular framework, then one of the things that you might want to say is that, well, we don't think that regulation could work because of corruption. Alternatively, we don't think we have a, sophistic uh, a sophisticated state or sufficiently capable fiscus to have rights-based instruments such as determining uh, the total allowable quantity of pollution. If that's the case, right, then one of the things that we want to move to almost uh, immediately is um, a set of behavioral policy too. Why? Because you can sometimes affect a part of your value chain quite profoundly by targeting the right uh, behaviors. And this is an example of where education of kids makes such a difference and using schools. Uh, if you just got uh, into the schooling system, a set of initiatives around uh, how to treat plastics or how to treat different forms of household waste, uh, for example. There have been experiments with keeping uh, waste diaries, getting kids to work with their parents to keep waste diaries, right? And this follows a, a form of survey methodology where uh, traditionally people have used expenditure diaries to keep track of household expenses. Instead, what they're now doing is using waste diaries to keep track of household waste. And what, what's being found is just by the kids keeping track of waste, the household has changed its behavior. That's one way in which a behavioral instrument can be extremely efficacious. The second is then to say, so let's assume that your schools nationally uh, became part of trying to increase environmental awareness and uh, plastics use or single base, single use plastics was brought onto the education agenda. The other thing that you can start trying to do if you thought that the private sector was capable of doing this rather than the state is to then start putting uh, different recycling bins to separate waste at source in the school. So even if you don't have it in the household because there's too much poverty, if you have it in the school or you have it at some other central uh, place like a hospital um, or some other form of institution, then you can begin your waste separation at source there. Now the advantage here is that you tie the behavior of the kids, let's say it's at school, you tie the behavior of the kids to not only the household and to making them think about how much waste they're using, but also then to bring that waste to the school and dispose of it in bins, which then the private sector can be kick-started if you didn't want the state involved and it was legal for the private sector to do this, you could then start off an entire value chain based on just getting the private sector to interact with schools to collect and to start your recycling um, initiatives. Now, of course, it's not that simple, but this is an example of how once you think through uh, this entire impact pathway of plastics, you also need to think through which of these instruments are going to have the highest levels of efficacy in the country of choice. And if that country is known to have an incapable state or high levels of corruption, even if it's a one municipality that's corrupt, but the other municipalities are efficient, then the one corrupt municipality, even within the same country, has the potential to derail regulation, right? We all know that that exists too. So then you have to think very carefully about then which are your lower costs, high efficacy interventions. 
And if that has to start with education, it has to start with education. But again, the point here is to bring to the attention the interrelated nature of these interventions. Once you start education at schools, it transmits to homes and parents. Those transmit into community and behavioral responses. You can then also use the schools as collection points for waste and start a process of community, small scale management of waste. And if there are opportunities in the private sector, to get that going there too. Um, the important point here is that there's never an opportunity not to get involved. There really isn't. And we need to stop uh, the kind of thinking that says it's okay not to deal with waste more generally because we're too poor or not to prioritize the environment more generally because we are too poor. And in Africa, we all know this is as some of the most least developed countries in the world. We know poverty is indeed a problem. But this is an example, and in my view, waste beneficiation becomes an example um, to have this pathway out. Start small though, you know, and start humbly and build from there, build local capacity. Uh, there's no substitute for local people getting involved uh, in this effort. And that should be the basis, I think, of any action plan. Um, for any African country or indeed uh, any other country. I hope that answers the question. And I, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to actually um, pass this away as a trivial question. I think it's fundamental. Um, and at the same time, I'm trying to say that, that you know, because of how we understand behavior to work, in economics, these behavioral nudges have really kind of uh, revolutionized our thinking of how to intervene in order to generate the outcomes that we desire. Um, if we desire a more pro-environmental set of behaviors among our people, we do have to have contextually sensitive interventions. Um, and that means taking into account local circumstances. Um, so in that, in that respect, you know, education then is one of these, these really high impact uh, interventions that have long lasting behavioral effects, even if you have uh, corrupt or captured governments or municipalities, uh, which prevent your broader waste beneficiation industries from, from blossoming to the extent that they could. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Riza. Um, thanks so much for, for the detailed uh, responses to, to all these questions. Um, I think it's very interesting to hear, particularly um, uh, <laughs> the, the ones that you mentioned um, as well about uh, island states and how, you know, how different circumstances will be needed for different countries. Um, I don't see any uh, questions in the Q&A box, but I think if anyone has any questions, please feel free to, to email us or to email Risa and, and we'll happily pass those along if they come through to the webinars at sctafrica.org.za. Um, for now, I think we can close here today, um, but thank you so much, Riza, for, for taking the time to present for us today and to, to give such a thorough understand, uh, uh, to give such a thorough explanation of, um, of the economics uh, involved in this. Um, I think we'll, we'll end it here for today. Um, we do have another session scheduled for Tuesday afternoon um, with Selma Skovhoi from uh, Pla the Plastics Revolution Foundation, um, who'll be discussing um, chemical recycling um, in, in an African context. Um, uh, thank you again, uh, Riza and Dr. Barrow for assisting us today. Um, Tony. You. You're welcome. Thanks. Uh, yes. uh, um, I, I just like to endorse what you say. Riza, really great. And, uh, and Mamadou, again, thank you for getting up so early. Uh, we really appreciate it. So, okay. Risa, I'm looking forward to working with you more as we move forward, and hopefully Mamadou and all the rest on this team, on this, let's work towards developing really good national and regional action plans, taking into consideration the variation between countries and the tasks that we will face in dealing with the variety and the, the diversity. Okay, so from my, my point of view then, thank you very much indeed, and thank you, Tara, for, for managing so well again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon or 
And or, or also to the translators, thank you very much indeed. Much appreciated.